All right. I'm very excited to welcome you guys to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds to kick off our Resident Research Day today. Uh, my name is Rina Hemrajani. I'm the Medicine Residency Program Director. Um, I am really excited about Resident Research Day today and specifically about Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, we had a record number of submitted abstracts this year by our residents and really incredible work. So thanks to our residents for your hard work and to our faculty who have mentored and supported our residents. Um, thanks particularly to our Resident Research Day organizers, Dr. Kemi Patad, our Star Research Chief, Dustin Smith, our Associate Program Director at the VA, and Vitas Carries. Um, you're going to be wowed by the breadth of projects that you hear about during Grand Rounds today and that you see this afternoon. Um, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Sadia Hassan. And after Dr. Hassan's presentation, Dr. Kimi Patad will introduce our three resident speakers today. Um, Dr. Sadia Hassan received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School, completed her medicine and pediatrics residency at Yale, and received an MPH degree from London Tropical School of Medicine and Hygiene. Um, in 2020, she joined us as an assistant professor in the Division of General Medicine and Rollins School of Public Health. Dr. Hazan is a physician and an implementation scientist who's passionate about reducing the inequitable effects of climate change. She's worked with the Pan American Health Organization in her areas of expertise, um, including addressing the needs of people living with non-communicable diseases in disaster areas. She has, um, uh, has funding from the NIH and serves as a PI on an EPA grant to evaluate the impact of climate change on vulnerable communities. Um, so really excited to hear from Dr. Hassan today. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to her. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Hemrajani, for the great introduction and to Dr. Kimi and the team uh, for the opportunity. I have no disclosures. So I was asked to talk about my journey, my journey into research. Uh, but at the same time, I was also asked to make sure I had learning objectives. So these are the learning objectives. To understand the role of implementation science in understanding health disparities, understand the impact, the impact of climate change on health disparities, and the impact of climate-induced disasters on the management of non-communicable diseases. So I'll achieve these objectives by taking you through my journey, my journey of discovering implementation science, disparities in NCDs, locally and globally, and the impact of climate change on those disparities. And as I was putting together my journey, I discovered four main themes that seemed to really guide, guide me in helping me find my way, but also um, really identifying some of the priority areas for myself. And I'll be referring back to these four themes uh, throughout my talk. So let's get started. So my journey starts here. I was born to these two beautiful people in Khartoum, Sudan. Um, and I'm just going to pause for one second on Sudan. Uh, and take this opportunity to ask you to all keep Sudan and the people of Sudan in your thoughts and your prayers. It's rare that we make the news. It's rare that Sudan makes the news. And unfortunately, when it does, it's not usually for good reasons. And we've had a very rocky history. And despite the hope that was brought on by the 2019 revolution that ousted a 30-year-long dictator, we seem to be back to square one, with fierce fighting between armed groups in our capital and around the country. So keep us in your thoughts and hoping the end comes soon and a brighter future is ahead of us. So I did my uh, early years in Sudan and then moved to Egypt, again for political reasons and turmoil, and did my high school there, before having the wonderful opportunity to come to the East Coast. I did my undergraduate in, in Boston and MIT. Uh, and then uh, was really excited about genetic engineering at the time. But a short stint at a Saccharomyces cerevisiae lab cut that very short. Uh, and so I turned to medicine uh, and after four wonderful years, uh, went to residency in adult medicine and pediatrics. And that's where I fell in love with primary care uh, and really put my heart and soul into primary care, but also discovered the, the really uh, the power of global health. The power of global health, not just internationally, but locally. So as one of my colleagues once said, in many ways, we feel that global health starts right here, locally. And so global health starts at home. And so I was fortunate enough to receive a, a fellowship award uh, to really promote uh, minority, minority uh, uh, physicians to go into primary care. 
and worked for four years at a federal qualified health center in New York. Um, and really, this is where I found my purpose. So I was able to work with refugee and immigrant populations, speak my mother language of Arabic, speak Spanish. 75% of my patient population is Spanish speaking, but really start to come face and head on with health disparities. And so in talking at length with my mentors, you see here, Dr. Sue Hewitt and Dr. Meredith Williams, to really start to understand what could I do beyond what I was doing in the clinic? What else could I do to drive solutions to address these health disparities? And it was in the midst of that mind boggling and thinking that, oh, and of course, during this entire time, somewhere in there, this happened. Um, and of course, uh, during the midst of that contemplation of solution-driven and solution-driven science, we had the opportunity to move to Tanzania, which is where my husband is from, where he's doing a resident professorship. He's actually a neuroradiologist here at Emory. Um, and so we did. We up and left and took our kids and spent two amazing years in Tanzania. Uh, I worked part-time in a private clinic practicing both adult medicine and, and, uh, and pediatrics, and then part-time at the National Hospital. But this is also where I was introduced to implementation science. Never heard of it. <laughs> I've done very little research actually throughout my, my residency and training and my time at the FQHC. Uh, but thanks to Dr. Doug Bruce, who worked at the same center I was working at before, who introduced me to Dr. Lambden, who introduced me to the amazing Dr. Mwambo. I became part of an RTI uh, project funded by NIH uh, that was integrating HIV care into a methadone clinic. Um, and so actually, uh, in many ways, injection drug use is driving the HIV epidemic in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, 300,000 heroin users in Tanzania, 50,000 who inject drugs. So it was clearly a priority area. But for some reason, they weren't receiving HIV care. I was not an HIV doctor. I was not a substance use doctor. And yet, this was an opportunity for me to learn about implementation science. And it was powerful. It was an amazing experience that not only led to publications, but led me to understand the power of implementation science, and importantly, the power of community and stakeholder engagement, which I had never really thought about as a research area prior to this. And so what is this implementation science? Uh, and I think this cartoon says it all. The latest research shows that we really should do something with all this research. It's the idea that we have all of this evidence that's sitting there that we're not putting into practice and policy. And the question is why? And so implementation science does exactly that. This is the definition for Fogarty, the study of methods to promote the adoption and integration of evidence-based practices, interventions, and policies into routine healthcare and public health settings. We take a gap, we engage communities and stakeholders to understand why that gap exists and develop solutions and strategies in a community and stakeholder engaged way to address those gaps. And so we work with communities and stakeholders. We work to identify gaps in the reason things are not reaching certain communities. And so in many ways, that might be a way and a tool to address health equity issues, health disparities. The same way we have populations that are not receiving intervention. Not that we don't know how to solve the problem, but it's just not working in certain settings. And so in implementation science, we're really focused on that how and that why. So to take an example, we know a bicycle, we have a lot of evidence that a bicycle can take you from point A to point B. We do not need to reprove that. But for some reason, there are some populations that cannot use that bicycle. It is not an effective intervention for them. And so in implementation science, what we do is study the methods in which we can take that bicycle and make it appropriate for a certain context in the population. Adapt it, find strategies for that adoption so that then we can, receive, we can achieve equity. So as I was fascinated by this field, two years after my time in Tanzania, I returned to Yale, an opportunity would have it that Dr. Nina Smith had just received a huge grant from NIH, and it was working for someone to lead her implementation for. So I took that opportunity and was fortunate to, to be part of the amazing Equity Research Innovation Center that really helped me drive and implement and do more in the realm of implementation science now much more in my wheelhouse, which is non-communicable diseases. And so I was part of this project, uh, the Lifestyle Intervention and Metformin, Metformin, uh, uh, Lifestyle Intervention Metformin Escalation Trial that was a diabetes prevention intervention in four islands in the Caribbean. 
um, and really helped me not only understand the power again of implementation science, but again, that community and stakeholder engagement, working with individuals to develop solutions and strategies for diabetes prevention that were appropriate for the Caribbean context. And in the midst of this, really making friends and friendships and colleagues and new mentors. And again, that power of stakeholder and community engagement. So you will see the date of this meeting, our inaugural governing board meeting, September 2017. Now, literally one week later, they returned home and this happened. So the hurricanes Irma and Maria, as many of you know, devastated the Caribbean and specifically our friends and partners and colleagues and participants in our trials in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands particularly. And so this was really a time when my purpose, going back to those four themes, really shifted. Because we quickly realized that these disasters had a huge impact on non-communicable diseases. The same non-communicable diseases we were spending millions of dollars trying to, to prevent. In fact, studies later showed that at least, at least 30% of the mortality after Irma and Marie was due to poorly managed non communicable disease. And the evidence for this has been building up over time, not only for cardiovascular disease and respiratory disorders, but also for mental health and perhaps importantly, mental health. We took a deep dive to try to understand what we knew, what was out there in the literature that might describe why we see these things. And these are some of the challenges that we identified. And as I was starting to mull this over, you know, the words climate change kept coming up. And we realized that climate change was causing, going to be causing a significant rise in the severity and the frequency and the regions of the world that are impacted by natural disasters. And as I dug more into climate change, started to understand that climate change had a myriad of health effects, right? A multitude of health effects, of which many are depicted here in the CDC schematic that shows you that not only do you have the four central things that are changing the events of, of climate change, but really there's a spread of effect of health from that. And then what I realized is that there is actually significant global inequity as a result of climate change. So in this schematic, this red are, are the countries that are called free riders, those that contribute the most in greenhouse gas emissions but suffer the least. Green are the countries that contribute the least in greenhouse gas emissions but suffer the most. If you look at it from a mortality perspective, this is a cartogram and you can see the same effect. The lower is the effect on mortality. Let's bring it back to NCDs. We saw, showed that climate impacts NCDs, and 85% of premature deaths due to non-communicable diseases happen in low and middle income countries. So this is what I'm now calling the new double burden of climate change and NCDs that will worsen global health disparities. But you don't need to go look globally. This is a local problem. In the same way that some communities here in the U.S. are more impacted by climate change, those are the same communities that have existing health disparities here looking at cardiovascular disease, looking at asthma, looking at mortality from breast cancer. The same double burden we could apply here in the U.S. Climate change with underlying NCD disparities will worsen U.S. health disparities. And so as Ban Ki-moon had put it, it doesn't, climate change affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally. Those who are least able to cope are being hit the hardest. And so in our lab, we spend a lot of time thinking about that, about vulnerability to climate change impacts. And understanding that that ability to adapt, that adaptive capacity is what we should be working on, just trying to strengthen that adaptive capacity. So our goal is to strengthen the capacity at the individual and institutional level to address the needs of people living with NCDs in the setting of climate induced disasters. And this is my wonderful team of students and research coordinators. And Stephen Perez does not like this picture when I show it. But of course, it takes a village and many thanks to the many people at Emory who have helped me start my kind of team and lab uh, in this field. And we work in the Caribbean. And we work in the Caribbean for obvious reasons. And we work at multiple levels, thinking about how we can strengthen adaptive capacity of all these levels. This is the project we work with with PAHO. An opportunity. Slim Slama from the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office of the WHO was talking about NCD kits, these prepackaged things that you could deliver and treat NCDs. Why could we just not use the same thing in the Caribbean when a disaster hits? And as this amazing team of people met to try to figure out how to study the feasibility and acceptability of these kits in disasters, 
this happened. Opportunity. St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And they called us up and immediately wanted these kits delivered to try to address their immediate needs for NCD management. So again, opportunity. We're now evaluating the impact of this. This is Kayla Holder, who continued this work in the Bahamas. She did her discovery project. Again, the beauty of working in the Caribbean, you get to send people to beautiful places. At the local level, at the institutional and individual level, we've been working in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands with federally qualified health centers there, working with an amazing team of people in those FQHCs, working using implementation science tools and system science tools to try to address again this issue of how do we better develop strategies to address this gap. And while the papers are still uh, in the process, we've had the wonderful opportunity to present this work at NCD conferences. But importantly, we're reaching solutions. And these are now the projects we're working on to strengthen awareness of individuals about their ability and their needs in the setting of a disaster. These are pamphlets now being used throughout the FQHCs to try to help physicians have those conversations with their patients. And we have a grant now under review that's trying to use community health workers to provide psychological first aid in the setting of a disaster. But this is not just a Caribbean, as you all know. This is Cyclone Freddy hitting Mozambique. It did a U-turn. It hit it once, went out, and came back and hit it again. And so thanks to a, a pilot grant from EGHI, this amazing team is now we're working on trying to do the same thing, and see these in disasters now in Mozambique. But I mentioned the work is local too. This is Reach Atlanta. This is our new EPA-funded grant, which is a great collaboration, School of Medicine, School of Public Health, the college, uh, coming together to really address resilience, equity, and adaptation for climate and health in Atlanta. And so with that, I want to leave you with my life message. There's no right path. There is your path. Take advantage of opportunities that align with your purpose. Find mentors who believe in you and your purpose. And your purpose should always allow you to find time for family and friends. And for the learning objectives. Climate-induced disasters will worsen global and local NCD disparities. There's a critical need to identify evidence-based strategies that can strengthen that adaptive capacity. There's a role for implementation science and importantly, a role for multidisciplinary collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. So grateful, and that was so good. We really appreciate you giving this talk. Um, I am going to pull up our next present, uh, presentation. And before I have our residents come up, I'm Kemi Fatade. I am the a research chief resident this year. It is nice to see you all. Thank you. I bet Dr. Law started that clap herself. <laughs> um, but part of the joy of my job this year has been preparing for and planning Resident Research Day. And honestly, I cannot tell you how incredibly proud I was of the work that our, res our residents and our faculty are putting out. We had well over 100 abstracts submitted this year, which I heard was a new record. And it was incredibly difficult um, to choose and narrow it down to these top four. But we were able to do it with the help of some incredible judges. Thank you to our site chiefs. Can we give them a hand? As well as some faculty um, and some of our fellows as well. It was really a, all hands on deck. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our top um, presenters. And this year we chose two case reports and two original abstracts of original research. The first one will be uh, the role of cardiac lymphatics in the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy and dysfunction in transplanted patients. And this will com come from doctors Anna Maria Dragon, Sydney Ginn, and Rebecca Levitt. And to present today will be Dr. Anna Maria Dragon. Thank you so much, Kemi, for the wonderful hype and introduction. Uh, so like she said, I'm here to talk to you about my project on uh, cardiac lymphatics, which is a relatively unknown entity. So I have no disclosures. So first I wanna introduce what cardiac allograft vasculopathy is. And what it is, is a leading cause of death in patients who undergo heart transplantation. 
It is a form of chronic rejection. And at this time, it's the major limiting factor in survival in these patients over a long period of time. Uh, currently, there is no accepted treatment or prevention for this disease. So thus, this is a great um, opportunity for us to sort of explore ways to sort of mitigate the progression of the disease. Um, it is a process that is unique to transplanted hearts, and it's characterized by a diffuse concentric intimal thickening of the coronary arteries, which is demonstrated in the figure um, to the left. Uh, below shows um, an artery that is affected by allograft vasculopathy. It shows the um, intimal muscular hyperplasia that occurs. And I want to draw your attention um, to the fact that it is a diffuse narrowing. So we see this uh, sort of phenomenon happen along the entire course of the artery. This is contrasted with the pattern that we see with typical atherosclerotic changes in which we find more focal lesions throughout. Uh, the pathogenesis of this disease is uh, largely multifactorial. It has immunologic and non-immunologic factors playing a role. And clinically, when we diagnose patients with this, we grade them on a scale of zero to three, zero being no evidence of disease and three being the most severe uh, form of the disease. So what is the lymphatic system? The lymphatic system overall is important in sort of promoting clearance of inflammatory mediators and draining excess fluid from whatever organ we're talking about. Um, in the topic of hearts, especially in heart transplantation, uh, during surgery, the lymphatic network of the heart is actually severed and never reconstructed again. So again, this is a great gap for us to elucidate whether there is a net benefit or a net detriment in doing so. So the potential benefits include, like I mentioned before, these anti-inflammatory uh, processes like draining fluid and mediators like cytokines and everything like that. But there are also potential detriments, including um, recruitment of these pro-inflammatory antigen presenting cells, which can maybe accelerate other types of rejection. Um, and they, these lymphatics can also um, predispose people to developing things like lymphoproliferative disease or metastatic spread. There were um, other studies in the literature, however, that showed a potential benefit um, in other cardiac diseases, such as heart failure, uh, to promote drainage and uh, prevent against cardiac edema. And lymphatic augmentation post-MI has also shown to sort of augment uh, healing. And so for these reasons, our overarching hypothesis is that the disruption of a normal cardiac lymphatic network um, will lead to buildup of these pro-inflammatory uh, factors and fluid, ultimately, reduced, uh, ultimately leading to reduced cardiac function and increased risk of progression of CAV. So our aims are to kind of explore all of these entities and the relationship between them. To do so, we have uh, quantified the lymphatic vasculature by staining endomyocardial biopsies from patients. We've determined the influence of lymphatic quantity on metrics of cardiac function and disease progression by using echoes and angio uh, data. And finally, we've explored um, the metrics of vascular remodeling uh, from angiographic data as a possible more sensitive marker of CAV as a whole. So for methods, we have a total of 27 heart transplant recipients um, who were transplanted here at Emory between the years of 2010 and 2015. We have biopsies from all these patients taken at several different time points, including one week, a month, a year, and five years. Of those 27 patients, three were double transplants, so they were excluded from the study. And of the remaining 24 patients, uh, 14 of them had a diagnosis of CAV, either one, two, or three within this time period, and 10 of them never progressed to CAV. Here's an example of the endomyocardial biopsy staining. Uh, the staining in green shows blood vessels, and red, if you kind of see the arrows pointing to, um, are the lymphatics. I want to draw your attention to this preliminary graph um, in which we compare patients who have had uh, CAV versus who have not had CAV, and we've shown that um, at one year out, those patients who did develop CAV showed a significantly reduced amount of lymphatic vasculature than those who did not um, have CAV. Here's an example of an angio from uh, one patient 
who actually progressed from having no disease to having the most severe form of the disease. And again, I want to draw your attention to the sort of like diffuse nature of this. Um, I don't know if my mouse works, but the diffuse nature of the um, disease, especially in the distal segments of all coronary arteries. Shown in yellow are the exact mar uh, points where I took measurements from, and those points were based on anatomic markers that were the same for every patient. So going into results, um, when we stratified patients based on their lymphatic density, uh, we've shown that where, whereas there's no significant difference in left ventricular ejection fraction at five years, there does seem to be a worsened diastolic function in those with low uh, lymphatics. Looking at the angiographic data, these are um, these show the change of coronary diameter over time. So that is the y-axis. Um, and then anything below zero represents a narrowing of those vessels over time. And so in this uh, study, we have separated patients based on their CAV status. And as you can see, there is a significant uh, decrease or narrowing of the mid LAD and mid left circumflex in patients with CAV, which is something we would expect. Shown here is a Kaplan-Meier curve of mortality, which again shows that there's a trend towards higher mortality in those patients with CAV, again, sort of supporting what we already know about the disease. Interestingly, when we stratify those same patients based on their lymphatic densities, we show a similar um, result. In once again, the y-axis is the change in diameter of the coronary segments over time. But in this case, we have stratified patients based on lymphatics. And what's shown here is that there is a significant narrowing of the mid LED with patients with low lymphatics. And there's at least a trend of uh, narrowing of the mid left circumflex, which sort of mirrors the results we see um, in patients with CAV. And once again, these results are mirrored in the mortality data those with low lymphatics also seem to have a trend of higher mortality over time. So in summary, we've shown that patients who developed CAV by one year overall had a lower lymphatic presence than those without the disease. Um, angiographic data revealed that patients with CAV had a significantly reduced mid LAD and mid left circumflex diameters. And these distal coronary segments uh, demonstrated a similar reduction uh, based on low lymphatic presence. We've shown that there's a higher mortality in patients with both CAV and lower lymphatic presence. And those with high lymphatics seem to have a better diastolic function um, over the period of five years. So in conclusion, we've shown that perhaps lower lymphatic quantity post-transplantation uh, seems to be associated with the incidence of CAV in both histologic and angiographic measurements. What's interesting is uh, perhaps we can extrapolate this even further and state that maybe the lymphatic presence or lymphatic density in these post-transplant patient, patients might predict overall survival um, or coronary diameter. I want to mention that these uh, clinical, this clinical project is part of a larger project uh, with Sydney and Dr. Levitt um, in which we're trying to explore the same hypotheses in rat models. So over here, I've shown kind of an example of our rat transplantations. We transplant a heart into a rat um, and we're exploring the possible therapeutic benefit of enhancing lithiangiogenesis by using a hydrogel with VEGFC, which is a lymphatic growth factor to see how that you know, affects the hearts over time. Uh, another interesting area of study is to determine whether the segmental analysis of angiograms could be a more sensitive marker of CAV than what di you know, diagnostic parameters we have currently. And of course, we have to keep in mind to weigh the potential long-term detriments uh, to having a robust lymphatic flow in you know, either the rats or human patients. But thank you to the Levitt Lab and all my wonderful mentors. Thank you all. Wasn't that incredible? Like, shout out to uh, Dr. Anna Maria Dragon one more time. And I'm not just saying that just because I'm a future cardiologist, I promise. Um, so let me just pull up our next presentation. We also want to say a big congratulations to Dr. Levitt as her mentor. So next we have Novo Large Language Artificial Intelligence Model 
accurately diagnoses clinical case vignettes despite not being designed for medical care. And the authors on this project are Drs. John Thomas Menchaka and Dr. Sarah Diane um, Turbo. And to be pre presenting this is Dr. JT John Thomas Menchaka. Thank you, Kemi. Sorry for the mouthful of an abstract title. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing this with you all today. Uh, we were doing this work right around when ChatGPT came out uh, at the end of November uh, and it has some pretty interesting results. Uh, so first, first in background, uh, ChatGPT is a tool that's made by OpenAI. Uh, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to play with it yet, you know, first, just what is it? Uh, simply, it is an artificial intelligence chatbot. Very simply, you can ask it any question and it will give you an answer. It is also a type of large language model, more specifically. Uh, you might hear it called a generative AI. And from a 10,000 foot view, 100,000 foot view, uh, these models are trained on enormous text databases. I tell them they're not missing much. <laughs> so that is, uh, that's the conclusion. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So again, OpenAI, it's a, or OpenAI is ChatGPT. It's a chatbot. Uh, it answers your questions, uh, really anything that you ask, and it's a type of large language model. Uh, at a 10,000 foot view, 100,000 foot view, it is a, a, a model that's trained on massive amounts of text data. Uh, and we're talking thousands of books, huge portions of the internet, all of Wikipedia, and originally just trained to predict the next word. I think a really a super smart autocomplete tool. Then, uh, and this is not doing it justice at all, but through a complex and really cool process, they fine tune it for human, uh, with human feedback to be able to provide helpful responses to people's questions. Uh, ChatGPT was not the first one uh, that OpenAI made. Uh, there were several before, and I just mentioned this to say that under the hood, ChatGPT is powered, or was powered, at least when it was released by GPT 3.5. There are also other companies that have tools like ChatGPT. You might have heard of Google's Bard, uh, and I would expect that other companies are gonna have similar models soon, just as a caveat. And why is this important that we investigate? So first, we should expect patients are gonna use these tools. Uh, we already know that patients use Dr. Google when they've got uh, a whole myriad of medical uh, symptoms and to better understand their illnesses. Uh, it's actually, it's, a, it's an important uh, resource, a very helpful resource. We should also expect that providers are gonna start using these tools. Uh, and some of you that might've had a chance to play with it can see that it really does have a lot of potential. And so we should ask ourselves, how good is it? And in order to do that, we should take one more step and say, how should we evaluate AI tools in general? Of course, accuracy is important. And in this study, we will look at very simply the percentage of questions that uh, ChatGPT gets correct. Uh, there are many ways that we evaluate this in research studies, uh, and, uh, and this is, you know, again, maybe the simplest. But there are other things, too. We need to ask, are these tools reliable? Are they reasonable, evidence-based? Are they specific? And are they safe? And we'll come back to these at the end. For our work, we just ask a couple of simple questions. One, can it make the right clinical diagnosis? And two, can it uh, recommend the appropriate level of medical care? And to do this well, we, uh, we want to do it in a standardized manner. So we turn to the literature and we look to see that there are existing studies that have already evaluated symptom checker tools is what they're called. Uh, these are tools where patients enter their symptoms and they'll give a diagnosis and some recommendations. Think WebMD, uh, but there are actually quite a few of them. 
This study used 45 standardized patient vignettes, and each of these vignettes has a, one, a clinical descri a description of medical terminology, using medical terminology of the case. It has a single diagnosis, and it has a recommended triage destination, either emergency care, non-urgent clinical care, or recovery at home. We provide ChatGPT these same 45 clinical vignettes and ask three questions. One, what is the most likely diagnosis? Two, what, is, uh, the, what are the five most likely diagnoses? And three, should they seek that emergency care, non-urgent care, or recover at home? And what do we find? Well, first, the most likely diagnosis that ChatGPT provided was, in fact, the correct diagnosis in 89% of the cases. The top five diagnoses that it provided included the correct diagnosis in 96% of the cases. In terms of triaging care, it correctly uh, sent people to the emergency room 100% of the time. Non-urgent non clinical care, a little worse, missed one case, we'll talk about it, 93% of the time. And in terms of recommending self-care at home, it was uh, only 33% accurate. And this is because the tool was more conservative, oftentimes recommending people seek out medical attention when, at least in this data set, they might have recommended otherwise. It's easier to just look at an example. This is a, a classic case of, uh, uh, and actually, I guess I'll, I'll just read through it with y'all. Uh, this is a 65-year-old gentleman, acute onset, shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain. He's got a risk factor that includes a recent surgery, immobilization, asymmetric swelling of his calf. Uh, and we asked ChatGPT, what are the five most likely diagnoses? It responds and tells us, based on this information, the most likely diagnosis is pulmonary embolism. And it provides some specific substantiation for why it thinks that's the case. But it also provides other diagnoses as well that are important to consider, pneumonia, CHF, MI, uh, and sepsis. And it also provides information about why it included those as well. When we asked what type of care this patient should receive, it was very clear this patient should seek emergency professional medical care. Uh, and one thing that I really appreciated about it is that uh, that third uh, bolded line that I have in there, it, it wasn't afraid to say that these symptoms could be life-threatening if not treated properly. And so what did it miss? Well, it missed a case of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which I think a lot of us here in the audience might have missed on a test ourselves. Uh, the the tip-off in the case vignette was that the patient was from Oklahoma. Uh, and then it also recommended seeking clinical, or it missed recommending seeking clinical care for a case of otitis media. Uh, the pediatric case uh, actually had an upper respiratory viral illness as well as otitis media, and it only provided a recommendation for the uh, URI, uh, and uh, you know, which is uh, you know an important omission and, and a concern for these tools. Well, at least these tools when they were powered by GPT 3.5, and uh, now a few months later, we're already in the next iteration, GPT 4. And when I gave both of these cases after this uh, this work was done to GPT 4. Uh, it got them both right. And it, it, not, not to mention, you know, these types of clinical situations, but we're seeing in other venues that the performance is at times an order of magnitude better, even than GPT 3.5. It's really stunning. And so what are the limitations? There are a lot of them. Let's go back to how we should evaluate AI. First, for accuracy. You know, how would it have done if the data were incomplete or if the text weren't medical terminology? or if a patient had been entering that text. You know, we don't know yet. Is it reliable? And this might sound a little interesting, but if we change the wording to the text a little bit, would the answer have been the same? You know, that is actually a problem that these models are facing right now. And it seems like they're getting better, but we, you know, we need to be confident that that's gonna be the case. In terms of reason, you know, is it the right answer for the wrong reasons? And is it capable of citing evidence? Right now, it can't. In terms of specificity, are its recommendations actionable, maybe in this case, but not in all cases? And then finally, safety. Is the answer potentially harmful? And I don't just mean the overt ways that it could be harmful, where it might miss a diagnosis or recommend clinical care where the risks outweigh the benefits, but also more insidious ways. Uh, you know, is it capable of perpetuating existing bias that we know exists in the medical record today? These are things that haven't been explored. And in general, uh, for all of these topics, the medical community does not have robust ways of systematically evaluating these tools, not just like ChatGPT, but other tools that might come out in the future or future versions of these tools. And so for the conclusions of this very small, very simple study, 
uh, I'd like to leave you all with the idea that artificial intelligence seems to accurately diagnose conditions in which uh, in, in clinical patient notes. It can also triage emergency cases pretty reliably too. And it seems to be getting better. Thank you. JT, Dr. Manchaka. Um, that was both exciting and scary at the same time. Our jobs are uh, on the line, folks. <laughs> Do it well. <laughs> um, but finally, uh, we have our last oral presentation today. And before I say that, I will preface by saying we had a second top case report um, by Dr. Eric Caliendo. Um, he will be presenting his case later this May at the Hospital Medicine CRC. So we did not want to burst the bubble, but congratulations to Dr. Caliendo, um, Dr. Helen Shi, and Dr. Dr. Annie Massert for their top uh, case report as well. So finally, we have Drs. Chidi Anunwa, Maya Krasno, Jason Cobb, Vinaya Patidar, and Lakshmi Kata. And they do not want me to ruin this case, um, but it is the, the title they will go with is Unmasking the Great Masquerader. And presenting today will be Drs. Chidi Anunwa and Maya Krasno. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming today. My name is Chidi Anua. And Maya Pazio. And we'll be presenting a case that we kind of want to do a little interactively. Um, we may not ask for your opinion, so like, <laughs> be shot out at us, but go ahead and think about the case as we're going through it. Um, we titled it Unmasking the Great Masquerader, so we'll go ahead and get started. This is a 22-year-old male. He um, presented with two weeks of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, dryness, and lower extremity swelling. Um, he actually present okay. oh. uh, he actually presented to an outside hospital two months prior um, with intractable nausea and vomiting. He underwent an EGD at that hospitalization um, and was diagnosed with H. pylori. Um, but treatment was stalled at the time because he was incidentally found to have some abnormal LFTs. Um, and at that outside hospital, he got an extensive workup, which showed a positive anti-mitochondrial um, IgG antibody, positive CMV and EDV IgG, a negative viral hepatitis panel, a mildly elevated F-actin uh, antibody IgG of 22, and then a normal right upper quadrant ultrasound. So when he got to us in the ED, um, for the most part, his vitals were stable. He was a febrile, he was normal tensive. He was setting well on room air. He wasn't to Um Just by looking at him, we could tell he'd been scratching all over. He had um, excoriation both on his chest and then also on his arms. Um, he did have some periorbital edema, some uh, lower extremity edema, uh, but he was regular rate and rhythm. On auscultation of his chest, we could hear some crackles on the back, but like I said, he was setting fine on room air. Um, and then his abdominal exam was significant for some tenderness um, throughout. Uh, he wasn't guarding no um, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, um, and he was not distended. In terms of his past medical history, um, as we discussed, he had biopsy um, confirmed H. pylori, but again, was not treated for it at the time. Um, no pertinent family history, including no history of heart, liver, kidney, or autoimmune disease. In terms of his social history, he lives at home with his parents. He denied any tobacco, alcohol, or illicit substance use. He works as a chef, and then he had multiple sexual partners of both genders. So his labs when he came to us, like we said, he's already had this month or two month long history of these elevated liver enzymes. When he came to us, the liver enzymes were still elevated. He had an AST of 87, ALT 91, ALPHAS of 858, and a T-billy of 1. His creatinine was 0.86, and he had a leukocytosis of 14,000. Um, his UA was significant for some proteinuria, greater than 500. Um, it was negative for blood, glucose, ketone, leukocyte esterase, and nitrites. 
but it was positive for uh, bilirubin. They had an RBC, um, some white blood cells, hyaline casts, and granular casts. We repeated his right upper quadrant ultrasound and that came back normal again. And then we did some imaging as well in the ED. Um, it showed some bilateral pleural effusions on his chest x-ray. And then we got an MRCP that essentially just showed some ascites and then also some like non-specific uh, enhancement of his liver. So at this point, we have a 22 year old male with a two month history of elevated liver enzymes. Um, there's like a cholestatic pattern because his ASC is a little bit more elevated than the ASC and ALT. He has right upper quadrant pain and obvious hypervolemia that we can see on physical exam and then also on imaging. Um, we have some nephrotic range proteinuria, a mild leukocytosis, and then a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody. So at this point, I'll give you a second to kind of think of what, where we're going with this. Um, at this point, we, when we had him inpatient, we didn't exactly know either. We were kind of thinking, is it uh, autoimmune? Is it infectious? Is it infiltrative? What's going on with him? So to go into a little bit of his hospital course, um, we did start IV diuresis because he became progressively more overloaded. Um, we ended up consulting nephrology um, for his nephrotic range proteinuria, and they recommended a kidney biopsy. Um, so we pursued that. And then um, just given um, his history, we um, decided to pursue a more in-depth infectious workup. Um, so for this infectious, wor infectious workup, um, he had a negative HIV screen. Um, positive IgG and IgM antibodies to both CMV and EBV. Um, he had a positive RBR with a titer of 1 to 128, as well as a positive treponemal antibody. And then his kidney biopsy um, showed membranous nephropathy, most consistent given his, uh, the data we have before with syphilitic nephritis. So now we know he has syphilis. Um, so after that, we gave him a dose of IM penicillin. Um, and then he also followed up with both infectious disease and nephrology. Um, he's now discharged from both clinics, um, but he had resolution of both his uh, lab work and then also his symptoms. Um, so then he was finally able to get treatment for that H. pylori he had. Um, so next up we'll go with the discussion. Um, so yeah, so hepatitis is a pretty rare manifestation of syphilis. I think that's not really what most of us think of when we think of syphilis. Depending on the source you look at, um, it occurs anywhere from 0.2 to 3% um, in patients who have syphilis. And then in terms of the definition, you need to satisfy all four of these criteria. Um, so you must have abnormal liver enzymes. And most typically, like we saw in this case, they're in a cholestatic pattern. Um, along with serological evidence for syphilis. Um, you must exclude any other cause of liver injury. And then finally, you need to have resolution of these lab abnormalities following treatment of syphilis. And usually this, you will see resolution about two weeks after you're treated. So our patient satisfied all of these criteria. So the thing that we were able to get from this is uh, syphilitic hepatitis can occur at any stage of syphilis, but most primarily you'll see it in secondary syphilis. Um, and it's a very non-specific presentation. Like he just came in with the elevated liver enzymes and the pain. Um, and then another thing that is to be taken from this is that his anti-mitochondrial antibody was elevated. Um, that is typically seen in PVC. However, due to molecular mimicry, it is usually positive in patients with syphilitic hepatitis as well. So putting this patient together, once again, we have a 22-year-old male, two-month history of elevated liver enzymes, um, presented right with abdominal pain, found to be volume overloaded on physical exam, um, and was eventually diagnosed with syphilis that was complicated by both hepatitis and membranous nephropathy, um, and he was successfully treated with IM penicillin. So in conclusion, syphilis should be considered when you have a patient with some nonspecific um, elevation of liver enzymes or liver injury and some questionable um, pieces of their history. Um, and it's really important to diagnose really early and treat early because, of course, we can risk having a progression to late syphilis. These are our references. Thank you.
Absolutely incredible. Thank you, Dr. Zanua and Dr. Krasno. I am so impressed um, from Dr. Hassan's call to action for all of us to look around us to see what implementation science is, is, is there and to see what we can do for our patients more than just putting out the research papers um, to Dr. Dragon's uh, call for us to think about what effects cardiac lymphatic changes post-transplant may have on the outcomes in our patients. Um, um, and Dr. JT Menchaka's exciting talk about the future, possibly, of medicine and how AI um, might affect what our patients, the questions our patients come to us with and the diagnosis that they make in their homes. And of course, Dr. Anuwa and <laughs> both of you, Dr. Krasner and Dr. Anuwa's talk about broadening our differential when we think about hepatitis um, to really think about as STIs and potentially syphilis, the great masquerader. Incredible, incredible crew. Just one more round of applause for all of them. And we have just a few minutes left for a brief, brief, very brief um, questions um, slash comments. Um, we're also monitoring the chat. So people at other sites, if you have a quick question for us, I will ask our speakers to please step forward just so it's easier for the crowd to kind of address and, and um, ask questions for all of us. Um, so I will send it out to the audience. Anything in the chat right now? Okay, come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question from Dr. Ray. Uh, is there evidence, JT, that um, patients are already using AI in their homes for, for advice? I briefly looked for information about this. Uh, I didn't. I didn't find anything that it could explicitly say. You know, we see this percentage of patients using these tools already. Uh, there is pretty substantial survey-based evidence that patients are using tools like WebMD, and uh, you know, again, there are a whole slew of them. Uh, and even back in 2013, I think it was a third of patients have looked up their symptoms using one of these tools. Uh, so I would expect that that number is only going up, uh, but I don't, I don't know of any specific resources. Any questions in the audience? We have a mic here for audience questions. Okay, Dr. Dressler. <laughs> Uh, thank you for all the all, And I'll just repeat the question. Does lymphatic preservation from a surgical standpoint change outcomes? Is there some evidence that that's our future? So I can't speak for a surgical side as an internal medicine resident. Um, I can imagine that reconstructing lymphatic vessels can be very difficult and not to mention time consuming. So I don't know if there's a utility on the surgical side to sort of preserve uh, at the time of surgery. But like I said, we're trying to promote the growth thereafter to see if that provides a certain benefit. It's easier to grow them than to tie them back together, I think. Okay, we had one question from the chat for Drs. Krasno and Enumwa. Was the patient with syphilis, um, syphilic hepatitis referred for PrEP? Um, so while he was inpatient, we did not refer him for PrEP, but um, it, that may have happened when he was with uh, the ID physician during clinic. We have not followed up on that, so I can give you a straight answer on that. Thank you all so much. One more round of applause for all our presenters. And a special thank you again for our keynote speaker, Dr. Sarai Hassan. 
And thank you to all of our residents. Just a shout out again to all of our residents who are presenting later this afternoon, 4 p.m. in the School of Medicine lobby. We want to see all of your incredible faces there. There will be over 90, res uh, 90 presentations and um, more opportunities for our residents to win some prizes. Thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you and happy Resident Research Day.